Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we begin with question number one from Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it can provide to the family of Jack Tar Singh Johal from Dumbarton in light of reports that he's been held in prison in Punjab without charge and has faced torture. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, we are deeply concerned to learn about the detention of Jagta Singh Johal. Uh, Scottish government officials have contacted the Foreign Commonwealth Office about this case. The Foreign Office has assured us that they are aware of the situation and have had access to Mr Johal. Uh, consular assistance uh, is a matter for the UK government and the Scottish government would ordinarily refer individuals to the Foreign Commonwealth Office's consular affairs department who work with foreign governments and authorities in these circumstances. Consular officials are continuing to provide assistance to Mr Johal and are engaging with his family. Rona Mackay. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to engage with the UK Government to ensure everything possible has been done to secure his well-being and release? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government officials are in regular contact with the Foreign Commonwealth Office and will continue to liaise with them with regards to this very serious case. Jackie Bailey. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Mr Johal was visiting India to attend his wedding and for the first 10 days was denied access to lawyers, British High Commissioner, representatives and indeed his family. He's not been charged, he remains in police custody and his continuing to be mistreated by the Indian authorities. I appreciate the representations made to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, but would I um, ask, urge the Cabinet Secretary to make urgent representations to the High Commissioner of India and to use any diplomatic channels open to the Scottish Government to secure his release? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we're very aware of the seriousness of the case and indeed um, the, the reports and allegations. Uh, we are very pleased that uh, Mark Field, the Minister of State for Asia and the Pacific, has uh, agreed to a meeting with the local MP, Martin Hughes Doherty, and the family of Mr. Yohal. And I'm sure these points that are being made uh, will be uh, presented during that discussion. I think the diplomatic approaches, as the member will know, well know, can be an opportunity to uh, you know, see progress in some areas, but sometimes the diplomacy of it might mean that we have to work with others to understand uh, the correct and uh, most useful way to make sure that progress is made. Question number two, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis is carried out of the economic importance of the port of Cairn Ryan to the southwest of Scotland and nationally. Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, we recognise the important role that the ports at Cairn Ryan play in supporting the economy of the southwest region and Scotland as a whole as part of advanced work in relation to the commitment to commence the strategic transport projects review in South West Scotland, Transport Scotland have commissioned consultants, or will commission consultants, I should say, to undertake a specialist survey and analysis of road-based freight using the A75 and A77. This includes estimating the value of goods being carried through the ports, which will aid analysis of the economic value uh, of the ports to Scotland. Brian Whittle. Yeah, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Uh, and if one looks around other ports in the UK that have attracted significant investment to help road accessibility, there are obvious examples, including £125 million M6 link road at Hersham and a £500 million A55 upgrade for the Holyhead port. Um, an assessment was made at, at, at Hersham that for every pound invested in the new Hersham link road will earn £4.40 for the local economy. Will the, the Minister take that into consideration uh, and, and, and look at the, to secure the long-term future of the ports of Cairn Ryan? Minister. Yes, we will. As part of the wider study that we're doing around the South West, it will certainly take the economic uh, importance, but also the important point that the member makes, which the A77 Action Group made to me, which I know he was present uh, at that meeting, as others were too, was we don't want to lose the competitive advantage uh, of the ports at Ken Ryan. So I'm very, very aware of that, uh, and that will certainly uh, be part of the consideration of the wider appraisal study that we're going to commence around the South West region. Question number three, Emma Harper. <clears throat> To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what action it has taken to end the illegal trade in puppies. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. I addressed the SSPCA event on the impact of the dog trade on canine welfare on 9th November. The final report of the Scottish Government funded research on the sourcing of pet dogs from illegal importation and puppy farms was presented to the event. We are taking the recommendations of this research forward into work with charities and enforcement agencies to create a robust strategy to combat the illegal dog trade and puppy farming. Particular concerns 
are on increasing public awareness of the dangers of buying animals on impulse without knowing where they came from. Initial discussions on the responses to the consultation on the non-commercial movement of pet animals order 2011, which controls the import of pets from outside the UK, have already taken place and the Scottish Government will continue to be involved in all further discussions with DEFRA and the Welsh Government over the coming months on completion of the review and on any future policy development on pet travel into the UK. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I'm interested to understand that uh, there are additional recommendations contained in the Scottish Government Commission report from Sheffield University. Um, what uh, additional recommendations does she think should be implemented as a priority? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, we think our priority should be to uh, work to ensure the public fully understands the risks involved in buying puppies which have been illegally imported or bred by those whose sole interest is making money and who have cautious, uh, callous disregard for animal welfare. So we're going to work with partners to change buyers' behaviour and reduce financial gain uh, to this pretty reprehensible trade. We'll also continue to support collaborative working between enforcement agencies. And there's a number of other recommendations that we will include as we take forward commitments made in the programme for government. Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that given the stress caused to seized puppies, which have to be kept in SSPCA kennels, at substantial cost to the charity for the duration of the court case, which can sometimes be years, that there is an animal welfare case for exploring a different approach to the cases of illegally trafficked puppies? And could she explain what action the Scottish Government could take to um, improve the current situation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, remember, we'll have heard the... Uh, indications I've already given to Emma Harper. It is the case that rescuers such as the SSPCA provide a very high standard of care for seized puppies and the Scottish Government is keen to identify ways in which the cost to such rescuers might be reduced. But also there is a cost not just in financial terms because uh, a lot of these puppies require to be put down as a result of the circumstances in which they have been born. Um, and that is a, a great sadness. So uh, again, uh, I want to re-emphasise the importance, particularly as we head towards Christmas, uh, uh, of, of people understanding that there are a lot of dogs awaiting new homes and rescue centres up and down the country. And we really need to urge people, considering getting a dog, to look at rehoming at first uh, option rather than uh, continue the, the, the reprehensible trade that we are seeing currently. Question number four, Andy Whiteman. I to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to enable the public to find out who owns land and property in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. As the member will be aware, in the vast majority of cases, it is possible to determine the legal owner of land in Scotland from the Land Register or the Register of Saisines. Scottish Ministers have invited the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland to complete the Land Register by 2024. Andy Whiteman. I declare an interest as the operator of the Who Owns Scotland website. A constituent of mine is trying to find out who owns five short-term lets in her tenement. She faces a £150 fee to find out information that's freely available in other jurisdictions. In October 2015, John Swinney approved the creation of Scotland's Land and Information Service. This went live this month, but consists of only a basic directory of addresses, searchable by postcodes and with a £30 fee. Today is the deadline for implementing the 2007 EU-inspired directive, yet the Scottish Government has failed to implement it in relation to cadastral parcels. When will the inspired directive be implemented? When will Scotless be functionals? And will ministers open up the registers of Scotland to be free to view? And will the Scottish Government follow the UK Government's plans, confirmed yesterday by the Chancellor, to create a free-to-view open land data platform to allow the people of Scotland to find out who owns our country? Well, of course, we'll be looking very closely at uh, uh, what the outcomes of yesterday's uh, announcements in the House of Commons chamber um, are and uh, whether or not uh, there is any reconsideration should be given uh, to what, uh, 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 what is available in Scotland. As the member knows, there's considerable amount of work being done in respect of registers in Scotland, not least of which bringing in uh, the register uh, of uh, controlling interests in land. Um, and uh, I'm happy uh, to speak either directly to uh, the member uh, myself in respect of this or perhaps uh, more appropriately uh, to suggest that he contact uh, um, Keith Brown who is the cabinet secretary who has the most direct responsibility for the land register. Question number five, David Stewart. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its position on whether there should be a pedestrian and vehicle ferry service between Gurick and Dunoon town centres. 
Minister Hamza Yusuf. The Government's programme uh, for Scotland 2017-18 stated that we would continue with a number of initiatives to further enhance and improve Scotland's ferry services, including the support, support of the town centre to town centre Gurik to Dunoon ferry service. We also committed to reviewing ferry services procurement policy and subsequently putting in place arrangements for the long-term delivery of our supported services. The Scottish Government will shortly publish an interim report on the emerging findings from our ongoing policy review into the future procurement of Scottish Government funded ferry services. The report will outline implications for each of our lifeline uh, ferry services, uh, including the Gurik to Dunoon town centre route. Mr. Stewart. <clears throat> uh, officer, will the Minister join with me in welcoming to the gallery uh, this afternoon uh, the Dunoon to Gurik Ferry Action Group? When will the Minister make a decision on the new tender? And could I urge him to use the Tickle exemption to directly award the contract to the David McGrain Group, wholly owned by Scottish Ministers? And finally, in the meantime, could I urge him to contact CalMAC to allocate the MV Kurusk to the route over the winter? Minister. I'll certainly look at, the, uh, look at uh, his final request and discuss that with CalMAC in terms of uh, the MV Karusk. You'll know that over the winter months, uh, dry docking and maintenance, uh, of course, of, of the fleet uh, is essential. So if he leaves that with me, I'll, of course, uh, re respond to him. Of course, I welcome uh, the, the, the Ferry Action Group uh, here. Uh, as I said in my previous answer, the interim report uh, into the Tekel exemption, uh, which, uh, of course, I must uh, applaud the member for, for leading the drive on, uh, is, uh, will be uh, announced in the next coming uh, few weeks. So uh, he and I share an ambition that we would prefer to have our uh, ferry services directly uh, awarded by an in-house provider, but he does know that we have to go through the state aid, uh, particularly the Altmark 4 criteria, uh, in order to satisfy that. So uh, my interim report in the next few weeks, uh, of course, uh, will be of interest uh, to him, and uh, I will outline uh, how we will take forward uh, the Gurik to Dunoon Town Centre route uh, in that uh, report. Maurice Corrie. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the ongoing problems with the Kilcreggan to Gurick ferry, which is affecting numerous businesses, commuters and people travelling for medical appointments from, from the peninsula. Can the Minister confirm that the Scottish Government is looking at transferring the contract for the Kilcreggan ferry to, to Transport Scotland and to maintain it as a separate contract from the Gurick to Danoon service, now that the song of the Kilcreggan ferry has been, had, its, had its debut on television this week? Minister. Yes, the, the Guruk to Kilcreggan Ferry is, of course, the responsibility of uh, SPT. Uh, we have had discussions with them about the potential transfer of that. Uh, the rules around and the criteria that have to be met in order of the transfer of the ferry uh, are outlined in the ferry's plan. I've had a good discussion, productive discussion, with the chair of SPT, Councillor Martin Bartos. We are awaiting further information from SPT, uh, but I must uh, make the point once again that it is the responsibility uh, of uh, SPT, uh, but more than happy to update uh, Parliament as those discussions continue. And I think, if I'm right in saying there's a members' debate uh, shortly in this Parliament, uh, but I'm sure we can furnish uh, the Parliament with more details. Question number six, Jackson Carlo. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what further progress has been made with the implementation of the Alcohol Minimum Pricing Scotland Act 2012, I suppose I might reasonably say since Tuesday. <laughs> <Can't> <laughs> uh, as as members already know, I'm delighted to remind them that last week the UK Supreme Court ruled that minimum unit pricing for alcohol can now proceed. This is a measure that was passed overwhelmingly by the Scottish Parliament in 2012 and we should recognise the global significance of the ruling for other public health measures. Once again, Scotland is leading the way and we should all be proud uh, to be at the forefront of such pioneering and life-saving policies. On Tuesday, I set out a timetable for implementation. After a long de delay, now is the time for action. Jackson Carla. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for those remarks and associate uh, Conservatives with them. Uh, the through no fault of the Cabinet Secretaries and because of the extended legal process that took place, we will be introducing alcohol minimum unit pricing at the point when we might otherwise have expected to be considering the evaluation under the Sunset Clause five years into its implementation. On Tuesday, there were calls from all sides of the Chamber, including her own, for her to consider whether the level of minimum unit price that is now being set is appropriate. Given that it was set five years ago, will it be appropriate 11 years later? And will she consider... Uh, to, to reflect on whether or not at least compound inflation in the period since the bill was passed might more appropriately be reflected in the price that is now set. Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, well, can I say to uh, Jackson Carlo, uh, as I uh, said in my statement on Tuesday, a, a consultation will be issued at the beginning of December and will run for eight weeks. And the outcome of the consultation, uh, well, the, the consultation will be both on price and the business and regulatory impact assessment. So, of course, we will listen to the representations uh, made. Uh, however, we uh, are um, clear that all of the modelling that has been done and the evidence base that has been presented has been based on the 50 pence minimum unit price. Uh, and therefore, uh, the government is of the view that we should proceed with that 50 pence minimum unit price. But of course, we're consulting and we always listen to the views uh, that will come back in consultations, including this one. So uh, Jackson Carlow, as many other members in this chamber, will have the opportunity, if they so wish, to input into that con consultation. And I would encourage him and others to do so. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Scottish Government will engage with retailers to ensure that they are involved in the implementation process? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I, I can uh, confirm that to uh, Richard Lyle. Uh, we uh, are keen to ensure that the, the views of retailers are taken on board. Uh, we want to work with them around the detail now of implementation. We believe that the time frame set out with the, the commencement of the, the 1st of May 2018 gives enough time for retailers to put uh, this plan into action and make any changes that they need to make. Uh, and we will work with them on the detail um, and get that underway as soon as possible. Question number seven, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its draft budget proposals will take account of the needs, opportunities and population growth of Edinburgh. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The draft budget proposals that will bring forward to the Scottish Parliament will provide the resources necessary to deliver the bold vision set out in the programme for government and balance the impact of UK austerity with the need to protect public services and strengthen the social contract. People across Scotland, including those in Edinburgh, will benefit from our commitments to expand early learning and childcare, raise standards in schools and close the attainment gap, deliver affordable housing investment, protect the police budget in real terms and increase the health budget. In addition, funding for the Edinburgh to Glasgow Rail Improvement Programme and Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Region Deal will help transform the region's economy and provide opportunities for all areas to grow with investments in housing, innovation, transport, skills and culture. Ben McPherson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and warmly welcome his support for our capital city. The Cabinet Secretary will also be aware that Tory UK government austerity and particularly welfare reform has led to increased instances of homelessness in the capital. Can I therefore ask what consideration will be given in the draft budget proposals to help tackle homelessness in Edinburgh and across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, can I say, uh, first of all, that uh, clearly the Chancellor set out a position uh, on a, a pilot in terms of a homelessness task force uh, and outlined figures of some £28 million investment uh, elsewhere. As I understand that there are no consequentials from this uh, coming to Scotland, but what we are able to do is, in understanding the impact on uh, welfare cuts at the hands of the UK a Tory government causing such major hardship. We have established a homelessness and rough sleeping action group to eradicate rough sleeping and transform temporary accommodation. But this government it will also support that initiative by creating the £50 million Ending Homelessness Together Fund over the next five years. Question number eight, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure there are no fire station closures during the current parliamentary session. Minister Annabel Ewing. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service plays a vital role in protecting communities across Scotland. Since the establishment of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in 2013, there have been no compulsory redundancies and no closure of any fire stations. This year, 100 new firefighters have been recruited and the overall budget for the SFRS has increased by £21.7 million to support investment in equipment and resources. No decisions have been made on what transformation would look like and the transformation process will involve liaison and discussion with staff, partners and the public. Neil Fendley. If everything in the garden was rosy, why did the Minister not go out and speak to firefighters today who are demonstrating outside this Parliament concern for their jobs, their fire stations and the safety of the communities in which they serve? 
Minister. Uh, well, uh, uh, Chris McLone, Denise Christie and the whole of the FBU team know that my door uh, is always open, Mr Finlay. But I'm sure the member would be interested to note that, in fact, the SFRS is proceeding with a new recruitment round for 300 whole-time firefighters, which round is to open on the 30th of November. And on the key issue of resource, what I would say is, if it is wrong for the UK government to take that off the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service going forwards, surely it is wrong for the UK government to hold on to the £40 million worth of VAT it has already deprived the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service of. So, presiding officer, I would say to the UK Chancellor, give us the money back.